Hey everyone, Forex here. Today I want to show you the four construct for SQF scripting. Useful in plenty of situations and a little bit different from the other ones we've talked about in the past. Previously I explained what the while do structure does, how it looks and how you could use it in your scripts. We also talked about if, then, else, how to create and use that one and we also talked about for each in a slightly shorter video, so pretty much all other important structures are already known to us, we know how to write them and what situations they are good at. Now I want to finish this part of scripting tutorials by showing you the for command and giving you once again a couple of good examples to demonstrate all commonly used properties of this structure. Let's begin. If you've seen the video about while do, I mentioned how similar these two structures are in a sense that they both repeat some code multiple times, and they differ in how they calculate the number of times it's needed to execute the code. So in short, the for structure is useful for cases when you need to do a certain thing or a multitude of things multiple times, but only one certain number of times. That is the difference from while do, where you are waiting for a condition to return false and in that case the loop ends, no matter how long it's been going for. Our for loop is always running a specific amount of times that you need to set, meaning that it can run 800 times or 10 times, but always that one number, not once more or once less. We will start with a very simple example and explain the more delicate operations later on. We will do a very simple countdown, say 10 seconds. This is a very typical example of how this looping works and we will also be able to look at the overall syntax for the commands. For structure has two different forms that you can use. One looks a bit more simple and clean and the other looks more related to C based languages and has some more fluff around but you should take it just as an alternative that isn't really worth investigating too much. The interesting thing is, the first syntax I described is several times faster in processing than the second one, meaning that the first syntax is objectively better, since it does exactly the same as the other one and is faster. We start with the word for itself, then make a string with our local variable that will serve us as a counting mechanism as we loop the code. In every programming tutorial ever you will find the use of letter i as the ideal variable for the for cycle, so we'll use it as well. I will be working with the local variable i, which will exist only in the for cycle. Next we have to define the number of cycles to be done, and we'll do so using words from and to. I said I'd like to make a countdown, so we will go from 10 to 0, and the last thing we need to say how to get from 10 to 0. The last word we use is step, which indicates what happens at each loop cycle. In our case we want to lower the number by 1, so we will write minus 1. So we create a local variable i, which we have here to keep our cycle number, and we will go from 10 to 0 where each one cycle gets the number down by 1. So the i starts at 10 and goes to 9, 8, 7, all the way to 0 where it stops and the entire 4 block is finished. We can do the same to go the other way and increase the value. We start at 0 and go all the way up to 10 where each step, each cycle adds a 1 to the value of i. And in both cases we have a block of code marked by the curly brackets where we can put our code that we want to loop and in this block of code only in here we can also use our local variable i which holds a number from the interval that we have set up. So for the countdown all I need to do is to add a sleep of one second so that there is a slight delay between individual messages and then display the value of i. It starts at 10 and then goes to 9, 8, 7, 6 and so on to 0. So the countdown is already taken care of within the structure of for cycle. Ok, I will also show you what the other syntax looks like if you ever needed to know that, although as I said it is a bit slower than the other one and we scripters never want the script to take too long to execute, as that creates unnecessary lag and lowers FPS in the game. This syntax is as follows. 
The same rules apply, only here the steps are divided in a slightly different manner. First we create a variable and assign it the starting value. Then we declare the condition when the loop needs to stop, in other words what value needs to be reached. And in the final part we say what happens each cycle. So we create a variable which changes value as we cycle through the code and we can use that variable for whatever purpose we want. I want to show you how useful this little i variable can be because we can use it in many creative ways, not just to display a number but a lot more. Let's say I have 10 words that I want to display on the screen, one by one. So I can either write 10 commands and 10 pauses or arrange my words into a little array and use the for cycle to go through this array. As you know each element of an array is indexed with a number. That starts at 0 and goes to whatever the total number of elements is, minus 1. We can use this knowledge to create a very simple loop, like this. We are using the value of i to select an element from our array. As i changes value, we are automatically picking one new element in each cycle. The cycle stops when we reach the last element, number 9, and we have successfully displayed all words. Another example, very similar in a sense, but with a little bit more wizardry. I will give you a small task, feel free to pause the video and try to come up with the best solution, or don't and keep listening. I have an array of sentences. Each element of this array is a sentence, a string with several words. Each sentence is different, contains a different number of words of varying length. The computer picks one of these at random, so you can't predict how long the sentence will be. I want to convert this sentence into the following form, where each word is on a new line, and display this result on the screen with hint command. So take a sentence and display it on the screen in a way that each word occupies one line. Feel free to pause the video if you feel ready and then I'll show you my result. So this is what I came up with. I'm sure it's not the only way, but this short code example can show you how much you can do with some knowledge of data types, for cycle and a few commands. At the start I have the array of sentences. These are completely random, you can't tell how long or short they will be, and I could at any time add or remove some of them, so we have to come up with dynamic ways to measure the sentence and the amount of words in them. I use the command split string, which allows me to split a string into an array of strings by a thing called separator or delimiter. That's some character or a series of characters that act as a marker to divide the string, or split it. In my case, I know that individual words are separated by a blank space, which is what I'm using to split the string. So now I have the individual words separated in an array. And I can use the for loop to go through this array, add a character slash n for a new line to each word and add that word to the final string. After I go through all the words from the array, I have a string that contains all words and a slash n in between all of them. I can display the final text and get the result that I wanted. And this is, in a sense, one of the last thing I can say about the for cycle. You don't need to input an explicit number into the from or to part, you can also use any command or combination of commands that return a number, so you can dynamically get a number of units, elements of an array, characters in strings, or any other number, and set it up as the limit for the for cycle. There's one last thing. It is possible and completely okay to nest one loop inside another. You can use for cycle inside another for cycle, just use a different variable, so make sure to name one of them i and the other j or something else. Ok, now we have the boring theory behind us, we know how the cycle looks, we have some approximate idea how it works and I hope that the following examples will help you understand how it all works and it give you a better idea of how you can work with the for loop. I was talking about counting troops, that could be fun, so let's say I want to show the player if the soldiers of his group are injured and how much injured they are. If you've been paying attention throughout this video, you can already guess the pattern. 
we will use the for loop to cycle through some collection of objects and then display some final information on the screen. We can use commands units and group to get the player's group and an array of individual units in that group. And the command damage to get the damage value of an object. Now it's just about putting it all together. In each cycle we need to pick one soldier from the player's group, get his damage value, multiply by 100 and display it as percentage. We also need to remember that arrays are counted from 0, but the actual soldiers start at 1. So we need to display a number higher by 1 than the one we are currently working with. This script conveniently displays the damage value for each member of your group. And it doesn't matter how big the group is. So that was working with units and commands that return an array of objects. You can have a lot of fun with this just to give you an idea. If I take these few lines of code a little bit further and add some flavor, colors and pretty effects, I can display colored info about each soldier's health. And if I want it, I could even keep this info board updating itself. So it tells me how are my soldiers doing all the time. And this is just a very quick example to demonstrate what can be done. And yes, it isn't entirely focused on for cycle, it's centered around other commands and the for loop isn't that massively important here. We could do pretty much the same with naming the units and calculating the value separately. It would also display dead units since those are automatically removed from their group when they die. But don't worry, I have another example for you. Because the for cycle is mostly used to go through several lines of code many times, it is often used to sort and edit arrays, create strings or construct anything from smaller blocks, like getting some results from several arrays and applying some effects on those selected pieces of data. Let me demonstrate on another example. I'll give you an idea for an entire mission. Meet Johnny. He is a drug dealer, an important member of a local group of criminals, and he has been somehow involved in several recent crimes, but nothing is certain yet. And you need to ask him some questions before you can be sure that he is actually the one who's done it. But Johnny has friends at the police headquarters and his personal records are corrupted. You can't get the location of his house or his actual name. All you have is the name Johnny and the knowledge that he is somewhere on the island. Luckily, you can visit each village and talk to the mayor, who can tell you if there's someone of that name Johnny or not, and point you to their house. You figure out that Johnny might be a nickname, and the person's actual name could be John, so you need to check for both of these names. Now, let's implement this beautiful searching mechanism in script form with several four cycles. Feel free to pause the video now and try to make your own solution and now we'll have a look at the final script. What I need to do first is to understand how exactly I want to approach the problem. It is clear that there are many people in a village or a town and I need to check each one of them for their name. So there will surely be one for loop that cycles through all people in the area. I also know that Johnny might be a nickname. So I need to check for multiple names, at least two, John and Johnny. And maybe his name is spelled without an H. So I would have three variants of the same name. In other words, I need to make sure my script can handle multiple names. So I will use another for loop. And I will have to check if a person's name is one of these three. I need to cycle through all people and for each one, cycle through my list of names and see if they match. I will therefore use a nested for loop. In other words, I need to put one for loop inside another. I will arrange my list of suggested names in an array and I will use near entities command to get an array of nearby people. Then I just need an empty array for all people that my script finds. By using two for loops, I make sure that for each person the script does check for each name. It runs through all units in the area and for each unit asks their name and tries to match it to John, then to Johnny and if I had another name in my array it would ask for that name as well. If their name matches with either of these, the unit is added to my new array. After all the searching is done, 
I then look into the array of units that have been found, and if it's empty, I can end the script with the mayor telling me there's nobody of those names around here. If the array, however, does contain some units, then I found a person or multiple people of the name John on Johnny. So I can create markers on the position of those units and the player can go there and investigate. So I've made a reliable, robust script and now Johnny's location can be randomized with some extra work. You could also randomize the searched name altogether, but that would take a bit more thinking. I've also made a very slightly edited version of the script to search if someone's full name contains John or Johnny, so the person's name can be anything. And if any part of it spells John or Johnny, he will be on the list. For the randomization of the names searched, you would probably want to insert the names as parameters and then have arrays of possible combinations and pick from those via random selection. Anyway, our script is done, we can test it in an example mission. What I wanted to show you is that you can nest the four structures into one another, you can use them in combination with many other commands or other structures like if then else. And they are a powerful ally when you work with arrays and possibly with strings as well. If you are more confident with other control structures like while do or for each, I'm sure the examples could be written with those instead of the for loop and they would accomplish exactly the same. However, knowing the for loop and how to use it can be very beneficial as some problems can be solved easily with one control structure while others could be used as well, but the code would be significantly more difficult to implement properly. So to have a complete control over your missions, the for loop is definitely an asset that you will use here and there, as it can be used in plenty of different situations. Okay, I hope the examples were interesting enough to keep you here until the end. There really isn't much more to say about the for cycling. After some basic introduction, all you need are enough examples. And I hope that at least some of those that I presented to you in this video helped you to understand how the for loop works. If you have any questions, feel free to share them in the comments down below. If not, well, I don't have anything else prepared, so have a nice day and see you next time.